This video is made possible by the Radix Domain Registry and the .tech top level domain. Get your .tech domain at get.tech. Not only that, but we've got a coupon code for you, Tech Tech Linux. And there's more information in the description, but you can use our coupon code and get your domain name for just $5 US. What more can I tell you about the .tech top level domain? You can get a domain like yourname.tech or stuff.tech, or in my case, I picked up wendell.tech. Even CES, the CTA, the organization that runs and organizes CES, has picked up cta.tech because, hey, they're a tech company. So if you're a startup or you've got a new idea or you just want to own your own short top level domain, you can get a .tech domain for five bucks and be able to host your email, your websites, and the whole nine yards. If you're watching this video, you're probably pretty technical, and I'm sure that you can watch other videos in this this series and learn how to set up your own Linux hosting, learn how to set up your own cloud, whatever you want to do. And the .tech domain is going to help you be able to do those things. If you've already picked up your .tech domain and you're doing something cool with it, I want to hear from you in the comments. It's a lot of fun to watch you guys set up servers and do interesting things with your domain names. And so it's been interesting to see what sorts of projects you guys are doing with your .tech domains. And hey, we can give you a coupon and you can get your domain name for five bucks. So. It works out pretty well for the both of us. So thanks very much to the Radix Registry for helping us out with the videos and the content. It's really great. And be sure to use that Tech Tech Linux coupon if you actually pick up a .tech domain. Let's talk about DNS. All the good things and the bad things that may be. Well, what can I say about DNS? <laughs> Why are you watching me to learn about DNS? If you're watching this video and you don't know about the other videos in our series, this really is a series about setting up your own personal server and sort of kind of getting you up to speed enough to be able to do that. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about Sandstorm and to a lesser extent, uh, why you know host. Those are some platforms that you can use to sort of self host, but you have to know at least a little bit about DNS in order to be able to host your own settings. There are better and perhaps more complete explanations of DNS that exist out there, but I can give you a little bit of background. I tried to watch a few other explanations about DNS to see what they covered and to see which ones were the good ones. Uh, DNS Made Easy uh, sponsored this one. And this one from DNS Made Easy is actually quite good. It's, it's very accurate technically and covers the very general basics of DNS and what DNS is and how it works. DNS is the system on the internet when your computer, you have your browser and you try to go to a website like example.com or google.com or you know your particular sandstorm host or whatever. It's a name. The name is not particularly useful to your computer. You need an IP address in order to figure out how you get from there to the actual server that has the actual files that you want to get at you, you need an IP address and so DNS is a system whereby those names can be converted to numbers so that the system can be found that's not to say that one IP address necessarily equates to a single website another technology came along later that made it possible to host tons and tons and tons of websites on a single public IP address and there's different kinds of IP addresses now there's IPv4 and IPv6. IPv4 you've probably seen before. It's an IP address like, you know, 192.168.1.1 or, you know, four numbers, 0 to 255 separated by periods. So that's an IPv4 address. IPv6 is quite a bit more complicated. IPv4 is 32-bit. It's four 8-bit uh, octets. So, you know, when you say 192.168.1.1, it's literally an 8-bit number dot and an, another 8-bit number dot another 8-bit number dot the last 8-bit number. 32 bits. IPv6, 128 bit. So you have exponentially more uh, addresses that you can support in IPv6. And those records that exist in DNS tell you how to get from A to B. But that's not all that DNS can contain. In fact, there are a huge number of different types of DNS records. Uh, the most common one, I think, probably, is an A record. And so an A record in DNS is the record that immediately tells you, hey, when you've got www.google.com, you immediately want to get to this IP address. But the truth is DNS is hierarchical. When you have www.google.com, the dots separate the layers in the hierarchy. If you're a computer science student or, or you know what I'm saying when I say that it's a hierarchical tree, it's a hierarchical tree from the root DNS, which is a dot that you don't see at the end of a domain name, to com, to google, to you know, www or from the root dot to com to example to www. And so the, the resolution sort of happens backwards in order to get the particular IP address that you want. But for your server and your own internal services, you can also hack it at the router level because DNS doesn't really come with much security. If there's a bad guy between you and your server, 
uh, the bad guy's DNS server can basically return anything, or you can modify your router to return whatever you want for DNS to make your life actually easier. And so when we speak about DNS in the context of hosting your own web server, really we're just talking about setting up some DNS records so that your domain name maps to this particular server, or that records in DNS more specifically, will map to your specific server. And so in the prior videos, we set up a Linode, but this could just as easily map to your home IP address or a home server, something behind your router, something like that. But the point of DNS is really just to uh, provide a directory service of, of sorts to be able to convert a name, something easy for human beings to deal with, into an IP address. And there are things that go with that. And so if when we look at, you know, an A record, one of the components of an A record is a TTL. It's a time to live. This whole DNS hierarchy thing is predicated on a cache system as well. Uh, and you can learn more about that in the, in the, in the uh, DNS video from DNS Made Easy. But basically, when you look up something, your computer and the computers along the way that had to help you look up something are not going to stupidly not remember what they just learned. And so there's a component of the DNS record called the time to live that is a hint to the servers involved in the transaction along the way about how long that record should live in their cache. And so for like the com in example.com and maybe the example, the time to live is typically very high. I mean, it could be as little as 30 seconds, but typically it's, you know, a day, a week, something like that, especially when we're talking about servers like com and so on and so forth. So you, you can configure this on your, on your DNS server. Now, speaking in the particulars, so if you picked up a .tech domain, uh, you can actually have the .tech CTA manage your DNS records for you. Now, this is something to kind of pay attention to. Not all registrars will give you a generic DNS with your domain. GoDaddy does, the .tech CTA does, uh, a lot of registrars do these days provide DNS services, but some registrars only provide a service where you can specify two name servers and then any query for your domain will be forwarded to those name servers. What does that mean? It's like, well, I picked up Wendell.tech. Wendell.tech is a lot of fun. If I want to have www.wendell.tech, I can log into the .tech domain name control panel and set up a DNS record for www on Wendell.tech. And by doing that, I'm setting an A record possibly a C name, but we'll get to that in a minute. An A record for www that points to the IP address of the Linode box. If I had a registrar that did not support managing DNS records, my only option would be to set DNS servers. And so I would have to go in there and set up, you know, ns1.something.com or ns2.something.com and point that to wherever my name servers were. And then I would host and configure my name servers. And then my name servers would have the www record and other records that will be uh, associated with dns and so you have things like your mail server records uh, there are some secure extensions for dns that's a relatively new invention called secure dns uh, you can also have text records and actually there's a huge number of records that you have here uh, on wikipedia so i mean there's a lot of really you know more exotic records and other more useful ones uh, we're going to talk about c names in just a little bit because c names are really useful when you're dealing with sandstorm and how stuff is hosted on sandstorm in particular but you can also use c names for great effect for hosting your own personal stuff so what does this mean to you well this is what you need to know minimally in order to be able to google the right things in order to be able to educate yourself a little bit more completely about DNS. This is not a comprehensive video about DNS. There are more comprehensive videos out there about DNS and all the different types of records that you can do and the different kinds of ways that you can exploit it to make your life easier, which is good. You can also hijack DNS. So if you control the router on your home network or your corporate network, you can hijack DNS. And so when somebody goes to look up google.com, you can point it to whatever IP address you want. And so in my case, one, one fun thing that I've done that doesn't have anything to do with, with self-hosting your own server, but well, it kind of does a little bit, is that on my internal network, uh, my TV server is just called TV. And so if I go to just TV, it takes me to Plex web server. This is a lot easier than remembering a computer name or an IP address or something like that. And so when I have guests and they're like, oh, can I browse the media collection or can I, you know, go look at whatever, or, you know, how do I do this? And it's like, you just go to TV and it's handled in DNS. And so you can't get to it from the internet, obviously, because there's no dot .com, there's, no, there's nothing there. It's that hidden dot from the other DNS Made Easy video. There's a hidden dot at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the thing, and it's a root lookup, basically. But the DNS hierarchy, at least on my network, 
is that the router is the first name server that the computers ask. And so if uh, my computer needs to go look up an address, it's going to first ask the router. The router may have an entry for whatever. And then the, the router is going to ask the ISP's name servers who are going to ask the root name servers, which are then going to tell the ISP's name servers where to find whatever, and thus continues the, the DNS hierarchy propagation. But by having direct records specified in the router, I can do whatever I want. And so in this case, I have TV set up, and I have a bunch of other aliases like this for wikis and for other internal services that are only offered on the local network. And so by doing this, we can have something very easy and convenient like TV. Now in the case of Sandstorm, uh, if you recall from one of the earlier videos, we set up uh, WordPress, uh, just as an example, a WordPress blog. And in the setup thing, it said something funny if you were paying attention and you're not familiar with DNS. And that was, if you have your own domain name, you should set up the following C name in order to map to blog.yourdomainname.com or www.yourdomainname.com or whatever. And it's like, well, wait, what, what the hell is it talking about? What's the C name? Ah. Glad you asked. So what it meant was that you would come over to your .tech control panel and that you would go into DNS management and you would do manage DNS. And so you would create a CNAME record for that. So there's a CNAMES record tab here. And right here is the value that it said for that particular WordPress install to use for the CNAME. So what a CNAME is, is it's an alias of one name to another. And so when a DNS lookup happens for blog.wendell.tech, for example, which is not real and doesn't exist, and you probably won't be able to get to it if you're trying to get to it on this video, but if you have a, a domain name like blog.wendell.tech or blog.yourdomainname.com or blog.whatever uh, or www.whatever, doesn't doesn't really matter, then you insert a CNAME record then when the browser gets that, the browser says, oh, it's not actually, you know, blog.wendell.tech, it's actually this other name. And so it'll try to look that up to see if that domain name is look upable, and if so, where is the IP address for that? So that happens, that DNS lookup happens, and that IP address points back to the Sandstorm server, and then so the blog is served from there. Now Sandstorm has an additional wrinkle, something that they've done to make the attack surface very small. WordPress historically is dangerously insecure. And so the thing that the Sandstorm people have done is make their installation of WordPress actually export your blog to flat static files. And so it's not the case that PHP or another dynamic engine is actually serving your files. Your instance uh, is really only running as long as you're accessing it, especially if you're using Sandstorm's hosting as opposed to doing your own hosting on Linode. Now, because we've done our own hosting on Linode, we can set up other stuff on the server underneath, and we're totally going to do that, like a mail server, for example, so that it's sort of running continuously. And because we have done that, that means that we can set up our own DNS records and we can do our own custom stuff. We don't have to do the CNAME thing, but if we want our appliances to be able to publish static records and we want to be able to get to them in that particular grain in Sandstorm, we're going to have uh, a CNAME instance that we have to set up in DNS, and that's how we do it. You just log into your control panel and set it up. Now notice along the top here that we've got, you know, the basic types of DNS records that are available here. We've got the A records, the quadruple A records. This is an A pointer for an IPv6 address. So if you're new and progressive and you know, you're, you're the hotness, you've got an IPv6 server or a server that has an IPv6 address, you can specify the IPv6 address in the quadruple A record. This is useful if you want to point something directly to somewhere else. So instead of a C name, you see I've got search.wendel.tech, which is pointing directly to this IP address, this public IP address. So if you want to, one thing that you can do, if you are doing Linode hosting or something like that, where you've got an IP address of your public machine, is you can go ahead and set up the A record for whatever to point there. So you can set up the A record for www.yourdomainname.com to point to the IP address of the system in question. Maybe you have a you know a home VPN. Maybe you want to set up vpn.yourdomainname.com that points to your home computer so that you can do a VPN to your home computer if you're doing that. Or if you're doing a VPN with Linode, sort of rolling your own VPN, then and it's convenient for you, you can set up vpn. You know your domain name.com to point to the IP address of your Linode. So if you're just doing direct IP pointing, you can do that. If you want to do a CNAME record, like if you want to put in a website address or another DNS name that you're going to point to, then you can set that up as well. The other record that I will mention is an MX record. An MX record is a mail exchanger record. It is a special type of record 
that tells other servers on the internet where to find your mail server. So if you are running Linode, uh, most ISPs on a residential connection really get all bent out of shape when you run a mail server on a home connection because they see that as a commercial activity even if you're just doing it personally. Most ISPs do not like that. Even if you're doing it on a personal basis, most people that would make it as far as setting up a home mail server eventually uh, won't update it and then it turns into a security liability for the ISP. So a lot of ISPs even block inbound mail services on a residential ISP. So you can run it on your Linode system. Hopefully you know what you're doing by now. A little bit with that because we did install a mail server during the first video so that Sandstorm would be able to send email. Uh, it's a little bit firewalled and it's not completely configured, but you can finish the configuration and hint, hint, that's gonna be what's in an upcoming video for this channel is doing uh, more stuff sort of under the hood, not quite the easy button solution. When it comes time to add a, an A record, I'll use an MX record as an example. It's asking you, you know, what you want to add it. And so it's like, well, uh, we're gonna specify, you know, our mail server if you had Google hosting your email because you, you really want to run your own server, but you're still going to let Google host your email. Kind of weird and silly, I guess, but okay. You could specify the Google Apps mail services in here and in the Google mail setup instructions, they will say, hey, specify this for your, for your MX. And now you know what that means. Um, the TTL, again, the time to live in the cache by default is 28, 800 seconds, which you could do the math on and figure out how long that is. And it won't let you set it for less than 3,600 seconds, which is an hour. So this is how DNS works. Then you have MX priority. And so uh, the MX priority is how important this mail server is in a stack of mail servers. The suite of stuff that you have going on as far as MXs go is sort of automatically redundant. If you have two or three or, or more mail servers, you can just specify the MX records. And the protocol is such that if a sending mail server does an MX DNS lookup to find where the mail servers are for a domain, and the first one's not responding, it'll go down to the second one and the third one and so on and so forth according to this priority entry. You know, if you're setting up Google Apps, for example, there are five mail servers of varying priority that you set up. So Google has, you know, five layers of redundancy, I guess, for the Google Apps hosting. Similarly with Microsoft Office 365, that's another really popular, you know, mail hosting solution. If you want to have your mail in the cloud, there will be all that stuff. You, with your little Linode, you're just going to have the one entry, unless you want to build a mail cluster in the Linode, which there are some open source tools to help you build a mail cluster that is similar in functionality to, you know, uh, Mandrel, uh, MailChimp, Mailgun, and other mail sending services, you can totally set up your own SMTP grid to send mail. Amazon has their own SMTP service. So you could have a clustered mail server if you want with more than one IP address. You would set that all up in DNS and it's a lot of fun. There's also TXT and SRV records. Historically, TXT records were meant for people, like notes to people. So if somebody wanted to do a TXT lookup on your domain, you could supply text to people. But uh, because DNS is a fantastically old protocol, DNS is one of the oldest protocols on the internet. Before there was DNS, there was a hosts file, which is literally a text file of IP addresses and server names and people would share that text file and that was the internet. Like that's how they did name lookups. And so it's like, you know, arpa.mil is the, the top of the text file. And then it's like, oh, okay, everybody. But you know, sharing a text file among all the computers that participate on the internet, uh, that's not good. That was, that was hard to do and thus enters DNS. And so DNS is one of the oldest protocols in the internet and it has to remain backwards compatible because it is so, you know, backbone of the internet. And so we've done all sorts of really clever things to extend it without, breaking backward compatibility. And one of the things that was built into DNS early on was this whole text record thing where you can have a text rec record for human beings, but increasingly we've extended to, to do other things. And one of the more popular things we've extended the text record to do is anti-spam. And so there's this type of text record that you can set up in DNS that says, hey, if you see mail from my domain from servers other than these servers that I've listed, then you should reject it. And so they've extended DNS to try to help stop spam because technically any mail server can spoof and send email. Even on today's internet, I can totally send mail as Bill G at Microsoft.com and there's not really a lot to stop me except that now in DNS and now very recent changes in the protocol, uh, the receiving mail server can look up in DNS, Microsoft.com and look for these very specific text records and other records in DNS. And it's like, hey, uh, 
you know, Wendell.tech is trying to send is billg at microsoft.com. Uh, is this legit? And the Microsoft DNS server basically says, no, that's not legit. But historically, there hasn't been really a mechanism to check for that. And so you don't really know because Microsoft is huge. They might have 7 million mail servers and 7 million IP addresses. You don't really know which ones are the right ones. But as time has worn on, people have figured out clever solutions for that problem. And so more recent changes in DNS have, have happened. If everybody used the TXT record to say where their mail should come from, then uh, spam would be a lot less. And actually that kind of thing has been really good for services like Gmail, Google, and Office 365 and, and that kind of thing because they have a relatively small set of servers that mail should come from. And historically it was really easy to spoof uh, sending mail from gmail.com. And in fact, it's not Google's problem as far as the spoofing goes. The recipient mail server has to be new enough to look for these extensions in DNS to know if it's spoofed. So you think about that, and that's a little convoluted, a little backwards, I think, than what you would intuitively expect in that kind of a situation. So when somebody shows up with an email and it says, you know, that it's from BillG at Microsoft.com or it's from somebody at gmail.com, my mail server has to be smart enough and up-to-date enough and be configured to know to ask Microsoft.com and ask gmail.com and ask, you know, who this message claims to be from, has to ask one that you know the mail server that this is coming from is this legit it's like a mail carrier shows up you know at your post box and says oh i've got letters that i need to stuff into your post box it's like no 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 you're not my regular mail carrier or you're not the regular mail carrier for these domains i'm not going to accept that message because these domains say that i should be getting mail from this other entity you aren't on the list i'm going to reject your messages right now if you don't have the list a lot of things like gmail and other services will put your mail in the junk folder. And so that's why I've been rambling about this for as long as I have, is that if you don't bother with setting up the TXT record for yourself when you're setting up your own mail server, then people that you send mail to, especially if they use online services for their email, may reject your messages or may put them in the junk folder because you haven't got all of your I's dotted and T's crossed with all of the very latest bleeding edge technology as far as mail goes. As quickly as new mail servers are set up on the internet, there's a 99.9% .9 chance that that new mail server on the internet is only there to send spam. And so with your mail server, you really have to dot your I's and cross your T's as far as the configuration goes to get it. And one of the big components of that for your mail server is getting DNS right. And so hopefully you're thinking about DNS exactly the right way. There's, a, there's some more other good DNS videos that you can see in the description for a more complete explanation about DNS. And we probably will also do, well, I'm hoping that we'll do a video in the future on DNSSEC, which are security extensions for DNS. Because if you think about it, it's like, wait a minute, you mentioned at the beginning that, uh, you know, I could hijack DNS and, you know, I could have TV go to, you know, my internal TV server. Could I also hijack Google.com to go to my internal TV server? And the answer is yes, you totally can. You can totally hijack any DNS that you want and have it go wherever you want if you control the first DNS server in the chain or, or really any DNS server along the way. You can hijack it and control it. And that's why some DNS servers, like your ISPs, like Time Warner and Charter and, and those ISPs, when you put in a wrong domain name and it takes you to a search page, <laughs> that is them hijacking DNS. They've broken the way that DNS works because normally DNS would say NX domain, non-existent domain, but ISP DNS servers never return non-existent domain. They always say, oh, it's over here. And then there's a web server over there configured to say, oh yeah, whatever you were looking for, it's this. And then it actually does a search for whatever it was that you're looking for so that the ISP can get ad revenue from that. For shame, exploiting a protocol in order to get revenue. This is not okay. At least this is not okay for the nerds that understand it. Now it's still going on, ISPs still do it. They don't really do it as much on commercial connections, but they definitely do it on residential connections. And so if you have control of your router and you wanna hijack DNS, you can totally hijack DNS. And for the people that already know all this and have hung in there with me for so long, because I don't know why, why would you watch that? That's crazy. I will share with you the upside down internet. And so if you figure out all those things and you have control of your own DNS uh, and you have guest Wi-Fi then one of the fun things that you can do with that is the upside down internet or possibly kitten war. And so what that means is that uh, you can hijack DNS and hijack unencrypted web traffic 
and do this to the unencrypted web traffic. Yes, this is a filter that uh, it takes the unencrypted traffic, redirects it through a proxy under your control, and then the proxy flips the images upside down. So when you browse websites, you get the images upside down and backwards. Ta-da, the upside down internet. If you just wanna mess with people on the uh, on your guest Wi-Fi network and you don't wanna bother setting up a, an actual proxy filter, you can just set DNS to redirect everything to Kitten War, which is this website, which is you click the cutest kitten and you know, it's Kitten War. Ta-da, done. That's just a little treat for the mis more mischievous among you. All right, well, hopefully that's been a quick enough introduction for DNS. I don't want to drone on too long. If you guys have any other questions or you're doing something interesting or, or whatever, uh, you know, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the forums. If there's something cooler than Kitten War or Upside Down Internet that you can do with your newfound control and knowledge of, of DNS, uh, then please do share with the group because I always get a kick out of, you know, that sort of thing. So I, I have a little bit of a mischievous streak myself, so uh, it's a lot of fun. All right, I'm Wendell, signing out. I'll see you later.